Hello, I'm Jessica Lyley and welcome to Aussie Wristwatch, where today we're going to delve into the history of the Breitling Number Timer. But before we go there, please do me a favour, please hit the like button below. And also, please, if you haven't already, subscribe to my channel by hitting that magic red button just a little bit to the down the bottom and a little bit to the right. Help me out with the algorithm guides on YouTube so I can keep this channel going where I talk about anything to do with watches, which I love. Okay, so today we're going to go through the history of the Navitimer, a watch that I have only recently actually discovered, which is fucking amazing because, I mean, it's such a cool watch and the history of this watch is unbelievable. So let's get into it. So, the Navitimer, which is an assemblage of navigation and timer, it was not the first slide rule watch. The honour belongs to Breitling's Chronomat, released in 1942, but the Chronomat was a worthy forerunner to the Navitimer, and the uninitiated maybe will be forgiven for believing it's just an early version of it. But to be sure, the circular slide rules of the Chronoma and the Navitimer helped Breitling be recognised as the public face of the Pilot Watch Company. Sensing a need for a self-contained wrist instrument for pilots, Breitling and the Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, the AOPA, jointly developed the Navitimer chronograph in the early 1950s. I don't know about you guys, but the 1950s had a lot going for it with watches. It's also the decade of the Omega Seamaster, among other watches. It debuted to the public in 1954, and the AOPA immediately adopted the watch as its official timepiece, and this combination of endorsement and the watch's innate functionality quickly made the Navitimer a favourite for pilots all around the world. The generations of the Navitimer produced through the 50s to the 60s were given the reference 806 designation and the movement in the earliest versions was the Valjou, the Valjou, I don't, you know with me pronunciation, it's terrible, it's the Valjou 72. The famous motor powered the watch for a year and a half before giving way to the Venus 178 in late 1955. In 1969, Breitling released the Navitimer Chronomatic Reference 1806, one of one of a family of self <coughs> one of a family of self-winding chronographs developed by a consortium of companies. Yes, I am still getting over COVID. Sorry, guys. It included Breitling, Hauer, Hamilton, and Bruin. The now famous race to build the first automatic chronograph produced multiple winners through the chronomatic beat of Zenithel Primero by a few days the feet gets an asterisk for being a modular movement with a micro router as opposed to Zenith's full rotor integrated movement. Seiko may have beat them all to the market but let's save that one for another time shall we? It evolved. The first Navitimer with a date window tucked away at 4.30, was released in the early 1970s. For many aficionados, this marked the end of the true Navitimer. Indeed, in the mid-1970s, the Navitimer debuted a series of quartz versions, the first with LED displays. I mean, it was the 70s, guys. And followed later by LCD displays. However, the trademark slide rule bezel was there throughout. There were countless style versions. The earliest were all black, produced both with a, and without the AOPA winged logo, both signed and unsigned versions. Later dials of this era were signed with the Breitling imprint and some had Geneve, Navitimer and Cosmonaut imprints. Silvery white subdials first appeared in the 60s. Breitling's own logo stylized two twin jets in close formation first appeared in 1964. The AOPA logo disappeared from most models of the Navitimer in 1965, while remaining an AOPA exclusive Navitimers until 1969 and on the Cosmonaut until 1979. I reckon someone's got a spreadsheet somewhere with all of that, but I do not. I'll spare us all. 
Hard Times and Quads. In 78, Breitling fell on hard times due to Willie Breitling falling ill. Swiss franc had inflated and the quartz crisis was in full bloom. But we'll go over the quartz crisis another time because in all honesty, I haven't done my research on that. Willie, grandson of founder Leon Breitling, uh, founder, founder buyer in Ernst Schneider and the Secura watch firm. The transaction was completed in 79. And adding insult to injury, poor old Willie passed away a month later and his namesake company officially closed its doors three months later. Out of the ashes of the old company, a new Breitling was born. Breitling Montre S.A. Ernst Schneider, an engineering and amateur pilot, had big ideas for transforming the company with the electronic revolution and he quickly put them into practice. New quartz watches appeared under the Breitling banner, but soon mechanical timepieces followed. Yay! The Navitimer reappeared in 86 under the guise reference 81600 with a manual wind. In 88, the Navitimer was again equipped with an automatic movement. It's interesting to note that the right to manufacturing the ex existing Cosmonaut and Navitimer models, but not to use the names passed to Mr. Helmet sign when the Breitling assets were sold off in 79. Navis today. At any given point <laughs> in time over the years, there have been multiple versions of the Navitimer. Optional dial colours, straps, bracelets, case material from steel to gold, special and commemorative editions, including the 2017 Breitling when it was acquired by CVC Capital Partners. It lost its independent status and the current CEO, Georges Kern, took over. Recent years have seen the scope of the Navitimer collection expand the current collection includes designs that broaden the traditional notion of the Navitimer, including non-conograph and time-only models. The modern Navitimer 01 is reminiscent of the early 806s, but in 2019, it saw the release of a historically faithful recreation of the 806 that's accurate down to many details from its case size to the number of beads on its bezel. The current lineup features a myriad of options, but the true Navitimer aficionados and pilots, the original vintage 806s really are what scratch their itch. Whether one's flying an airplane or at a desk, that's me. That said, it's hard to discount almost any version of the watch that spawned the genre and contributed to one of the more iconic watches of this lifetime. I, I don't know about you guys, but there's a book behind here that has an amazing story of these watches. Uh, it's got a rich history and it's an awesome read. And this watch is just amazing. The fact that it's, it's a mechanical calculator. I'm terrible at maths, by the way. So even with that, it's a bit of a struggle, but the concept and the way it's is genius. I love it. It's got a rich history. It's a watch that I'd really love to have in my collection. So head out and get an Avatimer if you can. They're not cheap, um, but they're a classic. And we'll look at the Cosmonaut a little later because that's a different iteration of it, which is also exceptionally cool. And again, please don't forget, like this video and subscribe to my channel for more reviews and history of watches. Thanks again, guys, for watching.